Hi, my name is Kanal, and welcome to the Geeks of the Valley podcast, which connects with some of the brightest minds globally who are leading their respective industries today to discuss the hottest upcoming industry trends and how their work is affecting the global economy. What started off as a coffee chat has now grown into a global platform for visionaries. This morning from the San Francisco Bay Area, We have a principal at Bain Capital Ventures joining us. Bain Capital Ventures has been around for 20 years with 6 billion AUM and has been an investor in all star companies such as LinkedIn, Docker, Clary, Gainsight, and many more. Prior, this individual was a product manager at Atlassian, where he led Atlassian Access, which is a security business. Please welcome Ruckgard. Ruck, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's a it's a pleasure to finally get time to do this. Uh, you might hear some angry meowing in the background. I'm currently cat sitting for a friend. <laughs> no worries at all. And 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 how are things over there in San Francisco? Things are things are great. I mean, it, it really feels like the city is starting to come back. Uh, definitely not as it was pre COVID, but it's uh, it's really great. Ruck, I'm happy to hear that. Uh, let's jump into the first question here, shall we? Let's do it. Uh, tell me about yourself and your background and how it led you to the path of joining Bain Capital Ventures as a principal. Yeah, so I, I grew up in the Bay Area, just south of San Francisco, and I learned how to code at a pretty early age. I used to play around with Linux distros. I, I used to mod my gaming consoles, um, just all around, you know, just trying to do anything I could with computers. I went to UCLA to study computer science in college and I very quickly was enamored by super low level computing infrastructure. My favorite classes were, you know, architecture and networks and uh, storage systems, databases. At the the same time, I really enjoyed entrepreneurship and startups. And so I was part of all these clubs and I was, you know, serving as the president of our, of our accelerator, just trying to help student entrepreneurs on campus. Um, and, And these two interests really led me down this path of trying to bridge everything I was learning technically as a CS major with all of the founders and the startups that I was meeting uh, as sort of a student leader on campus. I did a few engineering internships, probably most notably at Redfin, which you know went on to IPO. And I kind of realized I didn't want to be an engineer in industry. I, I talked to a bunch of mentors about that my junior year. And you know, one suggested that I try out product management, which is where I went after I graduated. I, I was a PM at Atlassian. Uh, I had a really good run there, you know, working with engineers, customers, data scientists, marketers. It was a really great role. We started a new product called Atlassian Access. We were trying to build security tooling around identity for some of our biggest customers. And I learned a lot of tough lessons over, you know, two and a half years about go to market and hiring and managing a team. Um, And then I left in late 2020. I thought I was going to start a company. So I played around with ideas. I met a bunch of investors. And eventually decided that I didn't really want to be a founder because I just really loved meeting people and learning about all these different areas. So I decided to join Bain Capital Ventures uh, as an investor in early 2021. I've been here since then, and I lead early stage investments in developer tools, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, cybersecurity, and data products. So I, I kind of call it technical things for technical people. And having a focus in ML and Web 3.0 infra, uh, what do you see happening in those spaces in regards to developer productivity? And and where do you see those markets heading in the next few years? I mean, both of those markets are just so early in their nascency. I, I'm really excited about both. I think they will both be huge, huge opportunities for internet companies. On the ML front, um, I think it's going to become a core primitive of the software stack. Up until very recently, I'd say even even today, there's only a few companies that can actually invest in machine learning and get something back. And that's the biggest, most well-resourced companies that we all kind of know about. I think that's changing for a number of reasons. The first being that a lot of people have left those great companies to start products in what we call the ML Ops stack or ML operations. And the stack is brand new. Every product in the stack has only been around for a few years, anywhere from pre-processing data to labeling data to storing that data so it can be trained on by a model. 
um, streaming systems to pipe it into a model and, and you know, train the model. Uh, and then all the software around the model. So doing model observability, serving, deployment, uh, inferences, all of that stuff is brand new, really, in terms of finding vendors that can do it. So one of the things that's very interesting is that this emerging stack has enabled companies outside of FANG to really leverage machine learning. And we're seeing all of that innovation in a, in a number of sectors. Uh, fraud, for example, is almost entirely ML driven now at most modern companies. Uh, we're seeing document intelligence penetrate many pen and paper industries like freight, billing systems, hospitals, healthcare. And we're also seeing developers be empowered to use machine learning in more and more software products. So websites are becoming more personalized, experiences are becoming more tailored, things are happening faster because uh, products are able to figure out what we expect as users and deliver that before we actually expect it. Recommendations are getting better. And so I think when I say core primitive, you know, machine learning is really going to become a core part of every app website product that we use. And that's very, very exciting. I mean, the, the possibilities that unlocks are, are kind of endless. On the Web3 side, the entire stack has been turned over because this is a new architecture, right? So in the 90s, we had this protocol-driven distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. And then that became centralized and the hyperscalers, all the big public clouds centralized it even more. And that was because we wanted redu redundancy, resiliency, uh, ease of use, we wanted a standard that we could connect to. And now we're seeing that that stewardship is shifting towards a more decentralized approach. One of the things in Web3 Infra that I think is really exciting is identity, specifically this notion of a self-sovereign identity that users control to authenticate themselves with apps that are built on various sort of layer one protocols. And in practice, that kind of plays out as, you know, you're not logging in with Facebook or with Google, where these two companies own the identity that you use on the internet. Instead, you would own that identity. And, you know, wallets are kind of a great example of this. A wallet identifies you to any chain that you want to transact with. And so if more and more applications get built in a distributed way, then you could imagine a wallet becoming what login with Facebook is for you today. And so I think a lot of these core pieces are being transformed. And I think identity specifically will be a, a really key turning point for the industry. And given the market, it has kind of fallen apart lately. What do you think founders should worry about when raising a Series A now? Yeah, so in, in a lot of these industries that you know I mentioned earlier, data infrastructure, AIML, Web3 infrastructure, it was actually you know quite trivial to raise a seed round over the last, uh, let's say, 12 to 18 months. And we've all kind of seen the effects of that on valuations sort of across the board. Um, Today, that's gotten a lot harder. A lot of that has corrected, both in public markets, in growth stage markets, and in early stage markets. It all sort of uh, you know, flows together. At the early stage, if you raised a seed round you know, 12 to 18 months ago, you're coming around to raise a Series A. The five sort of most important things that I think matter at this point, number one is revenue. Revenue is entering every conversation. And it's not really the amount of revenue. The base doesn't matter it's the quality and the trajectory of that revenue. So quality would be, you know, not doing the consulting projects or the one-off giant revenue, you know, excursions that a big company might send you on. High quality revenue would be diversified revenue from a number of sort of customers that you're proud to display on your website that use your product in the way that, uh, you know, you would expect them to, or that you kind of pitch your product as doing. So that is first and foremost, the most important thing at this point. The second thing is, especially for developers and technical users, this notion of product-led growth, you know, being open source, showing a non-linear sort of trajectory and usage, showing that whatever you're building is really resonating with this community in some way. And there's metrics for that. You can show contributors, you can show forks, you can show a number of Git analytics to, to prove that point. The third I'd say is, um, community metrics. So some of the best companies build communities around them. They build movements. DBT is an excellent example of this. DBT, I think, has 35,000 people on a Slack channel, and they are 
constantly discussing with each other new data tools, new ways to use DBT. That kind of fever, that that fervent nature of DBT's product proves that it's tapped into something new in the data engineer and data analyst workflow. So VCs are looking for something like that. Are your users making LinkedIn posts for you? Are they tweeting about you without even knowing you? Are they talking in a Slack channel, helping your users? Um, all that stuff goes a really long way. The fourth thing I'd say is uh, really quality of usage. So are the users coming from uh, high quality companies and are they using your product in production instead of for you know one-off projects or to small, uh, solve small problems? Uh, and lastly, you know, it's really the story. I think telling a tight series A story is about proving to the investor that you have found a way to do a task or a workflow that everybody is going to want to perform in that way in the future, with or without the investment now. And the investment is really just an accelerant to get there. Uh, and that that workflow could be data transformations, like in DBT's case, it could be building backends, like in Rails, Railway's case, it could be security analytics, like in Panther's case. I mean, th there's a number of sort of examples of this, uh, but I think those are the five components to raising a really great Series A today. And and given this, what have been some of the most exciting investments which you have made so far within the space while at Bain Capital Ventures? Yeah, th there's a number that I can't talk about because they're in stealth, but two that I can discuss that I'm really excited about. One is Viso Trust, which is a Series A in the cybersecurity space that we led uh, last year. Viso Trust as a company is solving this issue of trust. When you're a large company or a you know a, you're a security officer at a company, you're trying to onboard a vendor. You're trying to clear Dropbox or Slack for your employees to use at work. How can you trust that this application is going to deal with your data in a responsible way? You know, manage your data in a responsible way. It's it's actually a very high bar, and so. Historically, companies have sent out very long questionnaires that are formatted as Excel workbooks. These are you know, 300 rows long, and they force all of these other vendors to fill out each and every question before they can procure that product into their company. Viso Trust is automating that process. So the idea is if you are a CISO at, let's say, Zendesk, and you're onboarding Slack into your company, then the next CISO, maybe at Dropbox, that tries to onboard Slack, will have a much easier time doing so because someone on the Viso Trust network has already onboarded Dropbox, or sorry, has already onboarded Slack. And so for that reason, we can accelerate not only adoption for a vendor like Slack, but we can accelerate a company's path to, to transforming itself by using these modern, modern software toolings. Uh, so I think Viso Trust is, is a really ex excellent product and a number of CISOs all over the valley and the world are, are you know, really enjoying their usage of it. The second company I was going to mention is Tecton, uh, Tecton.ai. They're a data infrastructure company that makes it much easier to productionize machine learning. One of the things that you have to do in a machine learning workflow is create features. And features are attributes of a data set that you want to pull out and say, this is the thing that I'm going to focus on. And so you might have several features, right? It could be a feature might be age, location, uh, frequency of usage, and device type, if you're working on sort of an identity fraud kind of use case. And you need to update those features as new data comes in. So as new users log into your bank, you need to update the features so that you know, you're keeping your feature store uh, fresh and, and that freshness is what's going to lead to the model uh, performing, more, performing more robustly. It's really, really hard to do that. It's hard to build the data pipelines. It's hard to uh, manage the storage of those features. It's hard to update the features and it's hard to link the features to the model. And so Tecton automates everything around the feature store for a data scientist, data engineer, ML engineer, uh, and makes productionization very, very fast and easy for these businesses that are trying to get ML off the ground. And speaking of ML, when people say ML is primitive, what, is that, what does that actually mean? So a primitive in software is sort of a foundational piece of the stack that you use to build other apps. So one example is the representation of a number 
like an integer is a primitive and you'd find it in a number of languages, right? C++ has this notion of an int, Java has an int um, and so on and so forth. So when people say machine learning will become a primitive, they're saying that it's going to become something as foundational. It'll be a part of every piece of software. And I think historically, you know, there's been a lot of pushback to that claim because you know, we've all seen the, seen the memes of ML just being a linear regression or just being a series of if then statements. And I think that's because ML was very, very expensive to actually get into production up until maybe even a few months ago with the advent of Hugging Face and OpenAI. And so I think what we're seeing now is these companies, Hugging Face, OpenAI, you know, Google Brain, they're creating models that are much larger than anything we've seen before that are very, very performant and they're democratizing access to machine learning. And so in a world where that happens, where everyone has access to these very high quality models produced by these very high quality companies, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine a world where it doesn't become a part of every software company in, in some capacity, whether every product, so you know, transparent to the user or in the back office doing things like fraud and uh, you know, document processing or, or whatever else to aid the functioning of the company. Um, but but that, that's how I interpret what it means for machine learning to become primitive. So, Ruck, you know, we spent the last two questions really speaking about ML. And when it comes to actually doing machine learning, what are the technical challenges stopping people today? And how do people within the space go about finding talent to scale? So, for example, when it comes to operationalizing and productionizing uh, machine learning? That's a really good question. I'll, I'll tackle it in parts. So I'll handle the, uh, you know, the technical challenges first and the talent challenges second. On the technical side, I mean, there, there's several, right? It's, if we sort of enumerate the workflow, going from raw data uh, into a model and then getting inferences out of the model and then using the inferences to do something productive, you know, within your company or within your piece of software, there are numerous challenges at every step of that workflow. On the data side, uh, getting data that you can train on is really hard because data is very, very messy and it, it usually does not exist in clean sort of queryable formats. So especially with unstructured data, which is natural language, text, images, video, audio, uh, you have to figure out a way to make that trainable for a model. So you have to pre-process it, you have to label it so that the model knows uh, what it should be labeling the data as. You have to go back and fix the labels because a lot of the automatic labeling solutions don't necessarily work. And so you're looking for uh, a solution that can accurately and reliably go back and make it work. Typically that's been done with contractors. Uh, there's an open source product called CleanLab that is solving that problem. If you have cleanly labeled data sets, then you have to figure out uh, how to train a model with that data set. And it depends on which models you're using. A lot of people used to build models in-house. And so a lot of that work was custom, which meant that they had to do a lot of custom data preparation work as well to train the model. Luckily now, a lot of people are thinking that custom models will go away for at least 80% of the use cases because we'll use foundational models. These are the models that like I alluded to, OpenAI, Google, Facebook, you know, et cetera, these companies are building and open sourcing for people. So if that happens, then at least we don't have to build the model ourselves. But retraining these models is hugely expensive today. There's a giant hardware cost to be paid. And, and that's correlated to literally the supply of rare earth metals and lithium, like in the world. Uh, and today, NVIDIA kind of has a monopoly on those chips. But running those models, training those models requires a very, very extensive use of that specialized hardware. And then if you get a model trained and you've got all your data in the right formats, now you have to figure out how to use the things the model is producing. You have to have some kind of performance solution on top of your model. You have to uh, observe the model to understand if every part of that, uh, of those earlier steps was working the way you expected it to. And finally, you have to stand up an API that will talk to your model and allow your apps or other parts of your back office to interact with the inferences. Those are all very technically complicated things. And that's why a lot of the companies so far have had to hire um, 
you know, dozens and dozens of ML engineers and DevRel people and uh, evangelists to figure out how to make it work. So on the second point of talent, I think you can segment talent into two buckets. There's uh, data engineers, which are doing data engineers, data analysts. They're doing a lot of the data preparation, cleaning, analysis, uh, maybe pipelining work to shuffle data from that raw sort of unusable format to a trainable, clean, labeled, you know, ingestible format for a model. Then there's another category of machine learning talent. So these are ML engineers, data scientists, and they're trying to figure out how to specialize a model if it was off the shelf or how to build a model in-house if for some reason you still need to do that. One of our companies, MoveWorks, deals with very proprietary internal employee data. And so they have to build models in-house. It's very hard for them to uh, use something off the shelf. And there, there's many, many examples of companies like that where you know, you're dealing with something very uh, specialized that a general model is not going to solve for you. And then there's this third this third sort of bucket of talent, which is if you're an MLOps vendor or you're trying to evangelize machine learning tools, you need a lot of DevRel talent. You need developer relations people and developer advocacy uh, teams that can take this best practice or this workflow that you've identified and go disseminate it to the rest of the world. And that talent's really hard to come by, right? So I, I my advice to companies that I work with usually is, you want to identify who your audience is, and you usually want to hire someone who uh, has shown that they're technical enough to follow tutorials and write tutorials, um, very people-driven. Developer relations is a very hard job. You go to a lot of conferences, you work with a lot of people, um, very empathetic because you have to spend a lot of time in these communities and, and help people get started with this kind of work. Uh, and lastly, you know, just very amped and pumped up to learn a lot about these different tools. And one of the things I usually see with developer relations people is that they have their own followings because it's less about the company they work for. It's more about their curiosity and the types of things they're into, the uh, types of products that they're curious about or workflows they're curious about. On the technical side, you know that that talent is usually very hard to come by. But I, I'd say the the classical rules sort of apply, right? Which is that you want to find engineers who have worked on similar problems, who are eager to have a bigger impact, who want more autonomy. Uh, there, there's a number of reasons to leave a public company today and cratering stock prices is one of them. And so I think it's a very good time to hire if you're an early stage company uh, because you have all the upside, frankly. And so I, I think I think hiring is always hard, but in this market, it's actually uh, easier than I've seen it be before. And taking it a step forward from talent and recruiting and looking at developer talent, how do you look at go-to-market strategy and what steps would users take to monetize these product offerings? It's a really good question. I think it depends on the stage your company is in. So if you're an early stage founder, which is, you know, let's say seed series A, I usually recommend a two-pronged approach. You typically want to find three to five design partners. These are companies who are very engaged, who are bought in, who uh, have agreed to work with you and give you feedback. And in return, you're going to, your product is going to end up looking like something that they're going to use out of the gate in production. And these logos should be people that you're very proud to associate yourself with and uh, are actually sort of helping you battle test the, the product in production. That's a very top-down workflow. And so you want to you know, engage your network, other engineering leaders you might have worked with before, ML leaders you might have worked with before, depending on the nature of the product to win those design partnerships. The other prong is going bottom up. And so you want to attract an audience around you. And I've seen that be done in a number of ways. We talked about community, fostering a movement behind your product. We talked about uh, content. I mean, Twitter and LinkedIn are fantastic places. Dev.to is a great place to write developer first content and uh, you know, the, the more consistent and the more insightful you are actually contributing back to community knowledge, the better I've seen these blogs do. Uh, Fly.io is an example of a company who just has an incredible blog. Tailscale has an amazing blog. Um, and, and the reason I say they're amazing is because they're very educational blogs. I mean, they, they teach developers how to do a problem, whether or not they use this product or this specific company. And then I think the other part of going bottom up is understanding what your motion is going to be. So what is, what is the journey that a user takes 
when they see your blog, let's say they go to your website, what do you want them to do next? Is the right action that they pull your repo from GitHub? Is the right action that they uh, join your community and they get activated that way? I think being very intentional about the path that you want people to take and testing different things and experimenting those pads is, is very key. If you're a later stage company, go to market is more about efficiency. And so you wanna reach a lot of people without spending a lot of money to acquire them. We wanna engage in different ways. And so uh, you, know, you want to tailor that content to a specific vertical or a specific team or a specific use case. Um, the hyperscalers are very good at this, right? So AWS has got different go-to-markets for each of their uh, different use cases that they want you to use AWS in. I think if you're a growth stage startup, you can look at different vendors you should integrate with. For example, if you're a data company, is it time to integrate with Snowflake or Databricks? Uh, if you're a developer tools company, what other workflows do you have to be embedded in? I think those can be very powerful channels for, for go-to-market. And Ruck, changing the topic a bit in regards to your famous blog, uh, so far, according to your statement on your blog, you have helped approximately 47 people negotiate an additional 1.2 million US dollars in annual compensation at some of the largest tech companies such as Atlassian, Dropbox, Meta, Coinbase, and many more. What are some best practices when it comes to negotiating compensation? I should probably update my blog. I think both numbers have gotten a little bit higher. Uh, it's a pretty old number. Ne negotiating has always been tricky. Right. But and it's getting even more tricky because every company seems to be tightening their belts and every company wants to control cash burn, which honestly is mostly influenced by employee salaries. I think there's still a few strategies a lot of people can use and, and are using successfully. The number one thing to do is to ask. A lot of people don't try or know what their true worth is and can always reach out to me to figure out how much they should get paid at a startup. I think to actually do the negotiating, you have to figure out a few things. The first is, you know, cash is harder to negotiate for in this market, but you should still try. You can ask for, always ask for five to 10% at the minimum. Um, you can always ask for more equity though. And I feel like that's where the meaningful amount of negotiations happen. You can make the argument that you want to be around for the long haul, that you want to feel like you're more incentivized to stay, that, you know, you, you think you're going to get diluted or that you feel like the company, uh, you know, raised at a, a price that was unfortunate for your equity. You can make a lot of arguments for more equity. The second thing is figure out what percent of the company you own, specifically if it's a seed or series A company, because you wanna find out, do you actually own a meaningful amount of the company or are you already diluted to a very small amount? I think for early engineers at seed, that tends to look like half a percent to a percent. And so if you're already at you know, 0.05%, you should ask the question of, of why is that happening? And then lastly, especially in this market, have a very clear path to success. You should be very upfront that this is the number I need and I will take any anything closer to that neighborhood because that is the number that I need to be happy and to feel incentivized. You should be honest with yourself and with the founder of the company that you're, that you're looking to work for. Uh, I think not having that clear path leads to a lot of frustration on both sides. Uh, so the, you know, obviously there's a lot more that goes into negotiating, but I think it can still be done. It still is done very successfully and you should always try to do it. And Ruck, to wrap up our call with the last question for the day, what piece of advice would you give to people out there from the journey you have had so far in life? Yeah. You know, I used to get really stressed out about, uh, meeting strangers. I was very worried about cold emails and trying to meet people that I wasn't already friends with. I've learned that the worst thing that can happen is someone will ignore the cold email. Always send the email, always send the DM, the LinkedIn message, whatever it is. Uh, the worst thing that will happen is someone won't respond. The best case scenario is you've made a friend, you've found a job, you've you know earned a mentor or whatever the case might be. There's only upside. For people who are interested in catching a cup of coffee with you or having um, a Zoom call, what would be the best point of contact? Yeah, you can always find me on Twitter. I'm at Rack underscore garg and respond to most dms so excited to meet more people rock it was a pleasure having you on geeks of the valley and thank you so much for joining us today thank you for having me this was great have a good morning this podcast is brought to you by pytone an asian-based open source enterprise software company pytone offers a suite of software applications and infrastructure services to scholars and universities 